Commonwealth Writers' Conversation is um, another aspect of uh, Commonwealth Writers, the cultural initiative from the Commonwealth Foundation. Um, usually, uh, these conversations take place um, in particular countries where we're doing a particular project, um, and they tend to be uh, locally driven and locally organized and about a subject that is often quite difficult to talk about, possibly a bit taboo, possibly something that really warrants a public space to discuss further, hence the title, The Untold Story. Um, so that's really the, the aim of the conversations. This one is slightly different in that we've got a truly international panel and an audience from Kampala, so that's a great combination. Um, a panel that is going to explore the title which you, all, you have all read, South to South, Visions of Sustainable Development Through the Creative Imagination. Now, we could be here for weeks, but we're not. <laughs> um, those are all very loaded words, each one of them. Uh, the imagination is possibly the most fun of all that lot. But, uh, and that's the one we're quite keen on, in fact. Um, and there's, I can't think of a better lineup to start the conversation than uh, Shahid al Islam from Bangladesh, a photographer, Francis Coyer from Fiji, a poet and artist. I'll come back to Ella. And Mike Van Gran, playwright from South Africa. I'm using those, those aspects of, 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 of their work. Um, you've got a a very illustrious biography in front of you, because that's really the lens that we're coming at today from. And uh, this, is a, this is a conversation, it's a dialogue, it's not a monologue, it's an exchange of ideas. The, the, the panel will be chaired by Ella Alfrey, literary editor and critic and this year's chair of the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. And Ella will be chairing a discussion with our three panelists and then after about half an hour or so, open out to, to the floor when we really hope this is a truly interactive um, chat and has all the merits of the best conversations. Um, we're not that big an audience, so which is good news because we can all chip in. And so I hope you will and we'll see where we get to in the end and you can continue the conversation with us over a drink afterwards. So I hope you'll stay around for that. So Ella, over to you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, I've been here for a week and it's been raining almost every day. And when the sun came out, I was tempted to lie by the pool. So I'm delighted that all of you resisted that temptation. It's very nice to have you here with us this afternoon. As Lucy said, we're here to discuss the creative ways in which the arts can be used for development. And we'll be asking ourselves if cultural organizations can indeed be effective in placing culture on the political agenda as a driver of sustainable development and social change. Along the way, we'll be seeking some definitions. And I feel it's a wide question and one that has an infinite number of possible answers from across the world. So I'm delighted to be joined by three arts professionals to explore this topic. And they'll be um, speaking some more about, some about their own experiences. My, our first guest is Shahidul Alam, who's a photographer, writer, curator, and activist from Bangladesh. He's the founder of an award-winning agency called the Dirk Agency, and Pashala, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. You're very well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the South Asian Media Institute. He's also the director of the Choba Mela Festival and chairman of the Majority World Agency. His own work has been shown in New York, Paris, London, and Tehran, and he became Secretary General of the Bangladesh Photographic Society in 1984, and since 1987 has been President of the Bangladesh Photographic Society. Um, our second guest is Francis Koya Vakauta, who's a poet and artist from Fiji. A lecturer at the University of the South Pacific, her own work focuses in part on the question of the role that the arts can play in formal and non-formal education, and we certainly look forward to hearing more about that. And then Mike van Graan, who by um, dint of his um, residency, I guess, is my cousin from South Africa. <laughs> He's an award-winning playwright and the executive director of the Cape Town-based African Arts Institute. So do you call it 
Afi, you yeah. do pronounce it Afi, all right. Mm -hmm. And he's the founding secretary general of the Arterial Network, a pan-African network of artists and cultural activists. Um, and associate playwright of the Artscape in South Africa. So please join me in welcoming all three guests. Thank you. So I'd like to start the conversation by exploring this um, idea of creative expression and asking um, all three of you of some of for a definition, I guess. So Francis, I'd like to invite you to start. <laughs> I should have warned you again to be first. Um, I understand that your own doctoral thesis examined understandings of ecologically sustainable development through Samoan and Tongan heritage arts. And I was interested in that connection that you chose to make between environmental issues and art. And wondered if you'd speak a little bit of your understanding of the nature and perhaps the role of creative expression specifically in the Pacific context. Um, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Before I respond, I'd, I'd just like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to be part of this conversation. Um, it's very rare for a Pacific Islander to travel so far to be part of a conversation, so I am humbled. Um, I acknowledge the um, indigenous people of the land and, and thank you for a place to sit and, and speak. Um, thank you for the question. My thesis really stems from a place, um, a more, more of an academic space, I suppose. It was a way for me to find the balance between what I have to do, which is teacher education, and what I love to do, which is the arts, and, and just the role of storytelling. Um, in the Pacific, and I need to start with a, a very basic concept, and I suppose this ties in with your, your question about definitions. Um, in the Pacific, or in Polynesia, specifically in Samoa and Tonga, there is a concept called va. And when we talk about va, we're talking about sacred spaces or spaces between. And we talk about the sacred spaces between the living and the dead, the ancestors, the spaces between um, people and the environment, so the land, sky and sea, the cosmos, etc. Um, but of course, with development and the new development agenda, increasingly we're seeing these sacred spaces being exploited mm -hmm. and people no longer nurturing the spaces between uh, within families uh, and in the community and so that knowledge and also just the awareness and my own love for heritage arts and new contemporary expressions of those traditional art forms um, coupled with the fact that formal education continues to fail indigenous students all over the world wondering just how we might be able to learn about indigenous ways of teaching and learning. Mm. Um, and so just exploring the traditional arts of bark cloth making and uh, traditional tattooing and, and the kinds of storytelling and learning and teaching that takes place in those spaces was just a, a beautiful, empowering experience. And just coming back to, to writing and you know, the, as an extension of, of orality and storytelling as a core part of the teaching and learning experience that we've lost. I mean, so much of it is now passive book learning and rote learning. And I just felt that, you know, for me, that, that really was at the heart of it all, that, that you can't have a conversation about people and about culture without tying it very, very closely with the environment, that everything really is connected. Yeah. I, I love the expression heritage arts, and, and in your response there you, you mentioned contemporary expressions of these arts. But it seems to me that um, in, when you're speaking about a traditional way of living, art isn't something separate, it's a part of everyday life. And I wonder how you then square that with the idea of creative expression and a creative, maybe a creative industry as something entirely separate from our day-to-day -day lives. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's one of the biggest challenges we face in the Pacific, and I don't think it's specific to us in our region. But when you, you start using terms like creative industries and cultural expression and the cultural economy, mm -hmm. essentially we are talking the economy. Mm -hmm. And so we then begin to have the conversation about producers and consumers as opposed to lived cultural practice where the arts really is a part of who you are and there's a deep spiritual connection. So there's a serious conflict there, there's yes. Conflict there. Um, Mike, I, I guess one of the problems of the, of, sorry, of what Francis has identified as that sort of cultural arts as a, a commodity almost, is the use of it in measuring development. Are we okay then? Yeah, yeah that's all. Okay. 
and the idea that the development of that can be measured. Um, and, I, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit about this concept of development as something that's quantitatively measurable in terms of growth, and what we lose when we focus on that. <laughs> Wow, just a small question to start all the conversation. <laughs> um, I suppose what has happened over the last number of years is that for us within the arts and culture sector, for us to be taken um, increasingly seriously by politicians and others who make decisions about who gets funding, we've begun to speak their language, the language of development, the language of economics, the language of bean counters, essentially. So we've done you know, economic impact studies. We do these um, detailed analyses of the contribution of our respective festivals or our respective um, industries to the GDP and so on. And we hope that by so doing, we will basically be taken a little bit more seriously than we are by um, our politicians. And so they will invest more within the arts and the like. And I think that in the process, we do ourselves incredible disservices um, because, well, for, for a whole range of reasons. The first is that, you know, we allow our language or what it is that we do to be co-opted by, by market speak. And that's essentially what's kind of happened over the last number of years where um, trade in creative goods and services has become, you know, the almost defining, the defining <laughs> paradigm for the development of the arts over the last while. So UNESCO's 2005 convention, um, the big debates that have happened or the, the initiatives by the European Commission, um, you know, to promote the creative industries in Africa, where, you know, we've often been told that with the UNCTAD reports that were done in 2008 and 2010, that's the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, that really looked at the growth of the creative industries over the last 15, 20 years, um, they've kind of pointed out to us that our share as Africans of the global creative economy is less than 1%. So they've kind of been pointing to us and saying, you know, there's huge potential for the growth of the, of the creative industries on our continent. Also as drivers of economic development that would help to meet the Millennium Development Goals, which as we know, has, uh, they have a deadline for next year. So as opposed to wealthy countries investing in um, the realization of the Millennium Development Goals, which was you know, part of the original 2000, and, well, the 2000 um, decision at the United Nations, this was about us as Africans now needing to take much greater responsibility for our own development through generating economic growth through the creative industries. The reality is, though, that in Africa, we haven't had a problem with economic growth over the last 15 years. In fact, six of the 10 fastest growing economies, according to the IMF in the first 10 years of this millennium, have been African economies. Angola has kind of been growing at an average of 11.1%. Chad, Rwanda, Ethiopia, growing at astronomical um, levels of GDP growth. And yet that growth has not translated into development for the majority of people. Our people you know, 70% of our population lived below the poverty line in, 1980, in, in 1981. Um, and, and um, well, no, 50, 52% of our population lived below $2 or less in 1981. And that is pretty similar to what is the case now, 30 years on. So despite this huge economic growth, we haven't seen this kind of translated into, you know, development for ordinary people. It's really fueled um, an elite Within, with, within our continent. So I think that by kind of buying into this language of, of market speak, we've kind of sold ourselves short. We, first of all, it's, it's based on a false premise. Economic growth doesn't necessarily lead to development or the elimination of poverty or greater equity. But I think in the process, we do a whole bunch of things such as, for example, and I'll just end because I've been speaking about a bit, with an example of, of what happened uh, with the Johannesburg Art Fair about a couple of months ago where there was um, an artwork that was done by an artist. First of all, this art fair is sponsored by a major bank. And the idea is obviously to grow the visual arts market for South African and some African artists as well. There was one particular artist who painted this um, picture of, you would all probably remember the, the massacre of the miners that we had um, about two years ago in, in 2012. And he did this painting of um, the Queen of England sitting together with 
um, one of the ANC leaders who is a big shareholder in this mine as well, and them laughing while someone representing the president um, kind of had his dog um, really you know, biting the miners, as it were. And, and it was obviously making some kind of a statement about that particular incident with the dog kind of representing the police. And the organizers decided to take this work down because they felt, and the logic that he expressed, the organizer, was that they didn't want to compromise the growth of the arts market by having a controversial work like this. So in other words, you had a situation where freedom of artistic expression was being compromised by the perception of, the perception of what the market wants or what will go down with the market. And um, just an interesting aside on that story is that a whole bunch of other artists said they would leave the Joburg Art Fair if that work wasn't put up. And then that work was put up again and it sold for quite a significant price. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, but I think the point I'm trying to make is that what we think the market wants or what we do in order to, you know, grow this market um, could potentially lead to the compromising of freedom of expression for one. It's an incredibly powerful example. Thank you very much. Although I shouldn't thank you, Shadul, because I, my next question is for you. And I'd like you to follow on from, from what Mike has been talking about, that idea of sort of the, what happens when art meets politics. And, and by politics, I mean sort of social policies as well and economic policies. And I wonder if you'd speak about the, your experience in Bangladesh as an arts practitioner and if there are any similarities in what Mike has been talking about. Uh, well, firstly, I, I think we shouldn't shy away from the, the underlying structures relating to development. I, I, I come as a skeptic. I must be very clear about that. Um, there is this perception that development is about raising the standards of people in certain social situations. I don't believe it. Um, I don't believe it for various reasons. One is if you look at any system uh, generally, the requirement is for self-perpetuation. And if you have an organization that relies upon poverty to thrive, the idea that they look towards their own redundancy as a mode of success just doesn't work. Um, and in practice, that has never happened. Um, certainly development, wherever I've seen it, has never actually resulted in emancipation for the people. Uh, trying to be developed. So let's get rid of that. Um, having said that, we then t need to recognize how we negotiate with this space. And certainly, one of the things we, we need to consider is that uh, the development spectrum relies very much upon a particular relationship, a patron-client relationship, where certain people are givers, others are receivers. Uh, and any patron-client relationship, any relationship of that sort is a political relationship involving uh, certain structures, certain, certain allegiances. And I think as an artist, uh, one of the things we need to do is to engage with those relationships, expose those relationships, and recognize where we position ourselves within uh, those relationships. Uh, and as a photographer, um, as a visual artist generally, but as a photographer in particular, uh, my choice in becoming one was based on the recognition that um, our identities were largely defined by how developmental organizations, international media, perceived us, recognized us, um, expressed us. And I, I'll give you a little anecdote which might make it easier. I mean, uh, I'd like to stay away from academia if I can. It's uh, a long time ago, I was having a show in Belfast, uh, and I was staying with Irish friends in a city called Newry, quite close to Belfast. And they didn't have a big house, and they, they had a little girl, Karina, five-year-old, uh, and Karina's room was emptied out for Uncle Shahidal. And I love kids. Uh, we played, we were good friends. I came back from exhibition one day, I had some coins in my pocket, I'm just putting them on the table. And Karina, you know, usually when she sees me, she comes running up 
to me and jumps up my lap. We tell each other stories. Um, that day, she's standing there, like like uh, over there, Darshan is standing by the gate. You know, that that's uh, Darshan's a bit taller, but Karina's standing there. And, uh, and I say, what's the matter, Karina? She looks at me and says, you got money? I said, yes, I've got money. Then she goes, but, but you're from Bangladesh. You know? She could make it fit. You know, here's a child of a development working family who cannot equate a Bangladeshi with coins in his pocket. You know? And we need to recognize this cultural and social space within which a five-year-old grows up where a Bangladeshi's only identity happens to be an icon of poverty. And I think that is what needs to be questioned very, very much. And here, of course, poverty is related to a whole lot of things. Uh, and money is one, and I'm not denying the realities of lack of resources in many ways. But by and large, we all from very rich cultures. Uh, we have wonderful heritage, we have a lot to offer, and we are certainly currently, if you even look at the economic terms, as, as was talked about, uh, countries which are thriving in many ways. Though I will question the G GDP argument because that relates to monies coming into a country and doesn't relate to the betterment of people's lives. And I think they, they're not necessarily identical parameters. Um, but coming back to the original question, I think artists in our countries have played a very, very important role in questioning uh, this hierarchy, this relationship. And the nexus in all our countries between the well-to-do who have very strong ties with the donor community, with f our former colonizers, and the rest of us, the irony is that, of course, we have to survive. And in an effort to survive, sometimes we produce material which we know the market will buy, uh, and therefore we temper our work or produce work which is more marketable, as it were. Uh, and we take on the danger of becoming sheep in wolf's clothing. Uh, and it, it, it is a serious issue we need to deal with. So one of the things we did um, as an organization is to set up a platform for local practitioners to be telling their stories because I was very aware that this perception that Karina has is a perception that has been very carefully built and nurtured uh, and continues to be perpetuated. And the very organizations who perpetuate it are international media, um, developmental organizations, and you will often have, in a country like mine, a white Western photographer flying in at certain times, uh, suffering from diarrhea the first few days and the third day taking some pictures. But, you know, they will take pretty much the pictures you're expected to take, and that's where it begins. I'm not quite sure what to do with that last anecdote. Um, I was really struck by what she said about how we negotiate and how we deal with those definitions. So I'd like to invite a flight of fancy, going back to what Lucy said about imagination and what we can imagine. So let's pretend we don't have to negotiate and we can dictate. And I'm going to be the lead dictator. Always wanted to be. Um, You're an African. <laughs> A Zimbabwean at that. <laughs> so if I was lead dictator and I was in charge of everything everywhere and I said to the three of you comrades, we have the power to set the world to rights and I'm nominating you to be in charge of an artistic vision that places the creative imagination in whatever form you want to define it at the center, and let's not use the word development, let's use, let's use an understanding of at the center of our empowerment and our advancement. I wonder what a deal would you conjure? What would you come up with? And what would the world look like? Francis, I'm going to invite you to start, mostly because you look <laughs> worried about it. <laughs> My first thought was, good Lord, let's hope she doesn't start with me again. <laughs> Ah, in a perfect world, um, I'm going to make a few assumptions here. Yes. Um, as a dictator, I'm assuming that you have limitless resources. Absolutely. <laughs> um, it would be, um, I would imagine, 
uh, wide open spaces where young people could come to create with access to resources and access to mentors and access to uh, forums where they can tell stories in whatever art medium or art genre they choose to without the confines of having to live up to someone else's rules. I think that would be my, um, yeah, my utopia. Thank you. Shadul, what, what does your utopia look like? Okay, not being a dictator for a start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, to be very specific, I, I think in terms of changing people's mindsets, there are three areas of intervention. Um, well, four, but I'll leave out politics um, uh, for very practical reasons. I think they are culture, education, and media. Very, very powerful change agents and agents which influence the way we think, the way we believe, things we aspire to. Um, and certainly the latter is a very uh, big thing because by and large this whole practice of consumerism has allowed us to get sucked into a, a value system which is propagated by mainstream in collaboration with corporations and whatever which tell you that certain lifestyles, certain aspirations are the ones one must have. And I think breaking that is perhaps the most important one. We cannot live in a world of consumerism where everyone aspires to have 1.2 cars or whatever else, and it's just not tenable. Uh, but just giving it up isn't enough. I think we need to find alternatives. And one of the problems I have is in equations of GDP and equations of other things the things that are materially valued um, are things that relate to consumerism. And there are a whole set of other things which enrich in our lives, which do not enter into that equation. And I think that needs to uh, come in. But how does one do that? Um, I think mentors, teachers play a very, very important role. And one of the key things I would want to have in children growing up and ensure that it stays with them despite schooling, despite formal education, is the ability to question uh, and constantly um, be skeptical. Um, I, I think we have lost that ability. We have been trained into being sheep. We are trained into conforming. And in that process, not only do we lose the very important aspects uh, of finding uh, equality, and that, that goes all the way across. I left out politics, but even within politics, the, the most suppressed are the opposition, which I consider to be the most valuable component within the system of governance. But even within all our spectrum, uh, this need for conformity, which embeds itself into educational systems where you have to pass exams, where you have to do certain things, and reach certain standards or levels, I think is balmy. Uh, I think the more we find people who can question, the more we find people who can rebel in some ways, the greater chance we have. Thank you. Mike, we'll move straight on to you. What, is, what does your world look like? Um, my world would start with Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that states everyone shall have the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community and to enjoy the arts. Now, if we accept that this is a fundamental human right and it is not a right to be enjoyed only when, you know, all the other rights are kind of taken care of, which is the pattern which our government's kind of and development agencies seem to follow, then it's a question of how do we make sure that everyone does actually have access to this right. Um, and then it would be a case of starting you know, sitting with art education at schools, so that people are exposed to the arts from quite an early age and that they acquire the skills to be able to participate, uh, you know, within the arts, so that they have access to, to infrastructure. At the moment, it's really elites who live in cities who have access to infrastructure to be able to have access to the arts. Um, access to the arts is also about, you know, this is one of the ironies of, of, of post-1994, post-apartheid South African experience, where our policies were in fact premised, and I was part of formulating the policies premised on these particular values, only for the creative industries to kind of assume prominence, so that um, you have this, this irony of 
everyone having access to the arts now in terms of our white paper and arts and culture because the majority of people were denied access under an apartheid government and yet by adopting a creative industries approach we've essentially marginalized a whole bunch of people again who still do not have the resources to be able to access um, the arts because they don't have the disposable income. So, you know, I would, I would also then, from um, making sure that uh, people have the means to be able to exercise this particular right, I would try to develop a, um, a practice or an understanding of the arts that recognize that development you know, has, has at least three different components to it. There's, there's human development, which is premised on an understanding of human beings as holistic entities that have um, spiritual and emotional and psychological, intellectual and physical dimensions. And society's role is to cater for the realization and fulfillment of all of those, as opposed to, you know, the, the normal kind of Maslow's hierarchy sort of thing. I think there would be, and, and then one would recognize that the arts have a role to play just in terms of emotional catharsis, in terms of human enjoyment, in human growth, you know, there would be a second um, element that would recognize that, you know, within a social development framework, the arts can sometimes be utilized for instrumental purposes, such as educating people about HIV AIDS, for example, you know, all the things that sometimes we reject because we don't want the arts to be instrumentalized. But I think if it's seen as one of a continuum or one of a, of a package as opposed to the only thing or the primary thing, then it has its place. And I think the third thing is that we do recognize that the arts do have an economic dimension as well and do have um, a profit-making dimension. It's when that profit-making dimension of the arts as creative industries comes to be the only thing or the primary thing that is, is foregrounded in cultural policy that I think we lose all of the other elements. So I think we kind of need to recognize that, you know, within um, social development, in order to, re to make this right, this fundamental right available, we need to recognize that the arts can play a variety of roles mm -hmm. and that we need to be creating the conditions and the different funding mechanisms for these kinds of arts practices to be realized as well. So I wouldn't say that every single one of those things needs to be funded by one particular thing. I'd have an arts council type structure to fund art for human development. I'll have a kind of social development trust of sorts to fund um, the arts for social development purposes because people that you want to benefit from it are not necessarily people with disposable income. You don't want to, them to buy it. You want them to enjoy it mm. without having to purchase it. And then for the third one, you know, don't have an arts council. Have a, a, a low interest bank where artists can access resources to be able to produce their work and take it to market without you know, being constrained by things like, do we have collateral to be able to, to um, yeah, secure those loans? So I think one of the, one of the problems um, is that we are facing with this whole kind of culture and development paradigm is that we're not sufficiently understanding the, the relationship between human, social, and economic development um, and w what we are talking about in terms of culture and development. So we take a very kind of formulaic approach, which is creative industries, drives economic growth, and with that we'll be able to do all the other things. I started off this flight of fancy with a joke, but it seems to me that it's actually something that all of you have put thought into um, beforehand in your working lives. And the theme that comes through is this idea of approach that's holistic, that's looking at all of the different aspects that make up a society and make us, make us up as individuals. And several things came out, the idea of mentors, the ideas of sort of self-definition, as well as the idea of acknowledging that there are many different aspects. But it seems to me that none of these are necessarily something that speaks of utopia. It seems to me that they all should be entirely possible within our own lifetime. So I wanted to ask each of you again in turn, how far away you think your own particular society and environment is from these things, or if you have examples of things that are already working towards this ideal that you articulated in the, in the last round of questioning? This time I'm first. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Bangladesh is a particular example um, in the sense that while we have colonial histories and uh, we became independent in 1947, there was another set of colonizers who we had to get rid of in 1971. Um, so we've, we've actually dealt with this thing twice over. Um, and in the process, there was a, a very brutal civil war lasting nine months where the, the figures are disputed, something like three million people died. 
a huge exodus took place. Uh, but at that time, it really was artists to a large extent who played a very, very important role in holding together the morale that was necessary to fight that fight. And we, we forget the role of artists in, in that sort of a, a situation. And uh, I think if, if we are talking about the changes that have taken place, what is not recognized in a country like Bangladesh, while Karina recognizes that we are poor, doesn't recognize that there's an immensely strong, vibrant women's movement in a country like Bangladesh. It is seen as the Muslim country. So here I am, a bearded Muslim, and therefore I must have four wives who I horribly treat, and I have strained toilet habits, and all, all those sort of things. You know, these are the assumptions that are made. But what is not remembered is the fact that there was someone like Begum Rokia, who over a hundred years ago wrote some of the most powerful feminist literature that is still around today, that there is an extremely vibrant women's movement that continues to question and create space for itself. And I, I think it is time, while we looked at all those th sort of things, we saluted the people who've actually played this role, both artists and women in general. Hmm, this is an interesting one. Um, how far away are we in the Pacific? I think we're very, very far. Um, and just to sort of give you a little snapshot of the context, um, there is no Pacific word in any of the Pacific languages for art. Art is not something that you simply appreciate for purely for an, its aesthetic value. That when you talk about heritage arts, you're spiritually connected to the artifact which has no significance outside of practice, cultural practice. Um, and so this idea of galleries, the idea of artists, the idea of a writer is extremely foreign. Um, and so this whole development, the use of art to further develop the development conversation for HIV, uh, for other health issues like NCDs, climate change, etc., is increasingly popular because Pacific Islanders themselves finally see a value for the arts as a vehicle for social commentary, for dialogue, etc. Um, and I'll give you an example. So I have a good friend um, who purchased an indigenous Fijian woman. I'm not indigenous, by the way. Um, and so my husband's an artist, and, and this young woman, this friend of ours, comes to this art exhibition and purchases a beautiful painting. And so it's this wonderful... Um, hues of orange and okra and, and blue people and it was just something I fell in love with. It was 500 Fijian dollars, which is, you know, less than 200 US. Um, and she hung it in her home and she reminded herself and reminded all of us that she would never tell her mother how much she spent on this painting because, I mean, that's, you, you simply just don't do that. Um, and so, because she was so excited, everyone who visited her apartment, she showed her painting off to. And after a series of visits from friends, her mum came to visit, and she forgot. And so her mum says, oh, this is a very beautiful painting. And she says, yes, and it was only $500. And her mum stops and says, well, the next time you're hungry, don't call me. Sit and look at your painting. <laughs> and so, I mean, <laughs> I thought it was really funny, but that just gives you an insight into the way that we view arts and artists. Um, and, and my husband is a very successful artist for a very long time. My mum hounded him for the first 10 years of our marriage, saying, so when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> um, you know, just, just that kind of mindset. So for us, really, it's about changing that mindset and, and getting, getting people to recognize that the arts are a valid form of sustainable livelihoods, that you can earn a living, that you can put food on the table. But at the same time, it's also convincing the local market to invest. And we understand not everyone has a disposable income, and so they should have the opportunity to enjoy. But, but those who do need to be convinced that it is worthy of, of an investment. Um, having said that, at the same time, heritage arts and artists are relegated to crafts and crafts people. And, and for those of us working in the area, it's quite frustrating hearing people have those conversations where you say, well, we have the artists and the writers, and then we have the crafts fair. So you go into a gallery abroad, and you'd see a Pacific artifact beautifully, you know, installed on the wall and lights, and everybody's ooing and eyeing about it. And then you come to the Pacific, and you have a craft fair where everything's piled on the floor, literally on top of each other. 
So to just that, I think, is the very first step on a really, really basic level, not even getting into the funding and the resource conversation. Before we move on to Mark, I'm, I'm, Mike, I'm really interested in what you said about the idea of art being seen as finally having value and that it's, it's when you start engaging with its use in tackling environmental issues and so on. And I would really love an example of that. Is there something you can think of in your region? That, because it seems to me that it's an area where you feel that it's actually working. Um, I wonder if you could give us an example of that. Okay. Um, I, I should clarify. We, we do have artists who who attempt to make a living from the arts, uh, very unsuccessfully, I should say. Um, we have a few struggling writers who very quickly learn that you need a full-time job to support your hobby, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but as I mentioned, the success of, of these uh, development issues. Um, in 2010, no, it was 2009, we, we hosted at the University of the South Pacific where I work, uh, the Pacific Youth Festival. And um, the UNAIDS came to us and asked if we could put together a production that highlighted stigma and discrimination against people living with HIV. And so our approach was to actually work through the Oceania Center for Pacific Arts and Culture, um, work on the actual life stories of people living with HIV. Um, and so it was people who actually were HIV positive, but also their family and friends. And then creating a story, a narrative um, about a family and trying to pull in the culturally appropriate and faith-based um, approaches. Um, we, we staged that in Fiji twice, once for the um, youth festival and once for the Fiji community. And then we also took it to Tonga. Um, and then the group also took uh, excerpts to Tahiti. Very, very successful. Um, people, in the Pacific resist any conversations about sex because it's just culturally it's not done. And we're very, very good Christians, so we don't want to talk about it. So sex education is a no-no. And even when it gets, in, it finds its way into the curriculum, the teachers either don't teach it at all or the parents come to the school and threaten the teachers. So we're struggling having that conversation. Um, but we had people who resisted us basically bawling their eyes out and saying that for the first time they recognized that someone who contracted HIV was not the disease, that it was still the same person, that it was still someone's daughter or someone's sister or someone's mother. And so it was those, those meaningful conversations. So that's just one example. Um, last year we also had a, a production in Fiji using a number of uh, visual uh, forms of visual art and this year we're going to include the literary arts as well, looking at NCDs, which is one of the bigger crises in the Pacific, and that was also very... Sorry, non-communicable diseases, yes. So we're focusing on, on wellness um, and health, life stories about wellness and, and, and health in the Pacific, yes. Thank you. Um, Mike, just sort of closing out that discussion about um, our, our utopias and, and what the reality is, can you speak to us a bit about South Africa? And how close do you think we are to some of those ideals that you spoke about earlier? Well, um, we had an election in May a few weeks ago, and um, the new Minister of Arts and Culture is the former Minister of Police. So <laughs> I guess we've gone back maybe like 25 years. Um, this Minister of uh, this former Minister of Police is, in fact, the political incumbent responsible for the Marikana massacre. He's also the guy responsible for the shootings and killings of more protesters on our streets than any other post-1994 um, police minister. There have been many more people who have died in police detention on, on his watch than, than, than any other minister as well. And now he's been appointed to a ministry that really, you know, artists and the practice of the arts is kind of premised on freedom of expression. So if you have a guy whose police charges really you know, prevented pe people from exercising their right to freedom of expression, I think we, we, we're facing a little bit of a problem in our case. This is not to say, though, that there's an incredibly vibrant artistic practice despite government. And I think very soon there was a kind of recognition on the part of many people within the arts and culture sector that actually, you know, we had expected government to provide, but 
it ain't going to happen. So we need to get on and do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what has been happening. So there is a very kind of vibrant um, kind of arts and culture industry within the country. But of course, that means that people who have access are the wealthy, are the elites. And arts and culture practice and who has access cannot be divorced from, you know, broader kind of social, economic, political realities. Um, so maybe just to, I'll end off also with an HIV <laughs> kind of example. Um, in 1990, well, in 1993, um, the average life expectancy in South Africa was around 62. Um, as you know, in Africa, probably the, the, at the moment, average life expectancy is in the region of about 55 or so, sub-Saharan Africa. North Africa's a little bit higher in the early 70s. But at that time, it was 62. 20 years, well, 12 years into ANC rule, this is like after the demise of apartheid, our um, life expectancy plummeted to just over 50. So you have one of the major kind of human development indicators, life expectancy, to show that, you know, this is how well a society is doing. In fact, our society was doing incredibly poorly on that particular indicator. Um, I kind of wondered why it was that so many of my colleagues completely avoided the issue in addressing it in theatre. Given that theatre, historically in our country, had played a major role in exploring the human condition against the apartheid backdrop and placing this kind of on some kind of international agenda. And why it was that, you know, we had completely retreated from this. There were probably about five or six plays that addressed this subject, um, not in community theatre, but on the stages where people had to pay ticket prices to see it. I did this as part of a research project, and the overwhelming response from people was that this is not the kind of thing that our audience wants to see. You know, we simply, there's simply no market for this kind of theatre. So again, it was, you have the overwhelming experience of many people in the country being impacted upon by this major disease where at one stage, on average, a thousand people were dying of HIV AIDS related diseases in our, in our country. And our theatre makers were not addressing it as an issue. Why I'm telling you the story is because I think that a lot of the time when we focus on these kinds of discussions, we, we focus on, on government and those in charge of decision-making and policy and funding. And I think we need to look at ourselves as the arts and culture sector as well, and the extent to which we buy into some of the dominant discourses and the extent to which we actually conform to those and, and, and feed off that as well. And so at times, you know, we are the problem and we wonder why it is that you know, artists are kind of seen as an elitist bunch of practitioners by poor people is because actually we tend to have our craft serve an elite rather than uh, the broader masses of poor people in our countries. It's, it's a difficult truth to acknowledge. Hadul, I know that you wanted to respond to something Mike said. No, this actually to the question you were asked about. Ah, okay. I, I would at this point um, like to invite Charles Moleko, who is... Um, it's a very good follow-on, a Ugandan, a Kampala-based Ugandan playwright. And I wondered if you could add to what um, the panelists have been talking about, but specifically perhaps speaking a little bit about the role and status of artists within your own community. Um, we had, as we were discussing our utopia, the idea of mentors and teachers came up, but then also witnesses and activists. And I just wondered if you could give your own view to this. Um, Charles, come and get them. Oh, you have a microphone there. He's right here next to you. <laughs> Sitting right next to you. And I'd like to ask you to stand up just so everyone can yep. be sure to hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ella. Um, I wish to start uh, by celebrating Dr. Makumbi for shining, making Uganda shine <laughs> in this very uh, great thing. And I want to start by expressing my disappointment in you because <laughs> the last point you made is really my problem uh, in terms of the arts. I, I, we, we talk about... Uh, we talk about change agents, we talk about organizations, we talk about sustainable development. All these are, are big and wonderful concepts. But uh, I'm, I ask myself the question is that, is our focus perhaps in the wrong place? And if it is in the right place, have we been looking there too long that we've forgotten to look in another direction and see 
if we could see something else. And that's why uh, uh, that, that point you made though, I just want to hammer it home. I think uh, personally being a playwright, I can't think properly unless I'm thinking about drama. It's the lens I use. And so I remember this, uh, you know, Greek, Greek character, Oedipus. Something is wrong in his land. Things are totally rotten. There's a big curse. And he says, well, we, we've got to find this person who has brought this curse upon us. And they tell him, sir, you don't want to know the answer. He says, no, find the person. And really, he was looking for himself. So the question I have is, have we been looking at the UN and uh, UNESCO and all these organizations that have money when really we should have been looking at ourselves for a long time? Um, we've had people in Uganda especially uh, do wonderful things. They, they, they join these competitions, they win awards, and then they come back here and the story dies. It appears one day, I'm not on Facebook, but then people on Facebook tell me, oh, I saw it on Facebook. Okay, but then the story dies right there. I recently invited uh, Angela Emron to talk to my students. They were totally fascinated uh, after meeting her, but they had no clue who she was before they met her. But they're students of radio drama, playwriting. So we, we, how, when Angela won, did we, regardless of what politicians do, did we go to celebrate her? Did we hire a small vehicle, 14 seater, and go to meet her at the airport and bring her in singing songs, cracking jokes at everyone else's expense? Did we give her a black cup of tea? That is the question I've been walking around with. But uh, beside that question, let me just talk about uh, one thing he mentioned about change agents. He had a list and ignored politicians or politics. <laughs> I just want to read out my list. It involves culture, education, media, religion, politics, and in Uganda, military, or good portions of sub-Saharan Africa, the military. Now, again, the question I have is, how is it that we moved from poor position in the 60s and 70s to the position in which we are, to the position where we, on this list, we are more or less of no consequence until one of these other parties wants us. When, 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 <laughs> when, when we used to uh, lead uh, this group of change agents, but now the situation is changed. We cultural practitioners are totally, as far as I'm concerned, in the background. Uh, that is not to say that I do not know that there are wonderful organizations like Femright, uh, ACME, uh, Kwani, African Writers Trust, uh, even I, I, I would add to my list KPC. Those, I think, are well-organized, consistent organs that make cultural practices happen, mm. but at individual level, what is it we're doing? And the, lastly, on the question of, on the issue of questioning, I shall evoke Fanon's prayer, or my body, make of me a man who questions. Thank you very much, Charles. You brought up several points, and I, I liked very much the way you echoed Mike's idea that we need to look internally, which brings us to a really important part of this discussion, the idea that instead of um, seeking definition elsewhere um, to the so-called developed West or to the North, as it's referred to now, there is the potential perhaps to, do, to talk to each other as southern regions. I wanted to ask the panelists and then also sort of some members of the audience about this idea of a south-to-south -south dialogue, about this idea of a definition of self that involves all of our various communities, but not necessarily the Western worlds. And I'm 
I'm not going to pinpoint anybody else, but I just wondered if one of the panelists wants to kick off that response. Mike is smiling, so yeah, let me well, ask you. Mainly because it was something that we were talking about earlier today, but um, maybe not to go into any kind of detail, but um, it's something that, that we've been wanting to kind of do for a while, is um, traditionally kind of what tends to happen is that Global North organizations, development agencies tend to have relationships with the various continents kind of independently or international organizations like the Goethe Institute, British Council and the like. So they have a European, Latin American relationship, European, Asian, European, African and so on. And there's never any kind of dialogue that happens between people and activists from those particular countries themselves, you know, by themselves. And I think that there's a a real need for that kind of discussion and, and we've been speaking about possibly getting to a point where there are people coming from the Arab world, from Latin America, from Asia, from Africa, from the, from the Caribbean and Pacific, just to begin to interrogate some of these international policy themes that are introduced to us that really have the origins in global north conditions. Um, and depending on how those conditions change, so the cultural policy themes change as well and the resources attached to them become different. So, you know, at some point it's like all about the creative industries and or, or about um, cultural diversity. Once you had the World Trade Organization dealing with liberalization of trade in creative goods and services, then you had 9-11 happening and then it became a different thing. It became, we need not cultural diversity but intercultural dialogue and, and so on, you know. So the, the discourse kind of changes and we, embrace these things in the global south because our governments don't necessarily support the arts so we take on board these themes because there are resources attached to these things and we then panel beat our projects to align with these new themes I see lots of nodding heads in the audience uh, <laughs> but but i think that you know there's a real need for us to be talking to each other first of all and maybe affirming or asserting an agenda that might be common to our conditions and then on the basis of that agenda you know entering into dialogue with partners, international partners, to see how it is that we can cooperate with each other to create a better world. I'd, I'd like to invite um, David Kaiser, who is, again, um, has volunteered to give us a local view. Um, David, you're an advisor to the Duran Foundation, but I just wonder what your view is on the possibility and, and maybe some examples of the reality of this perhaps regional dialogue in this case, is, is it something that actually is viable, sustainable? Is it happening? Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Oh, it is. It is. Just OK, uh, thank you very much. Um, um, okay, just take my microphone. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, I, th I think the echo is coming from I was standing somewhere around here. Yes, um, Charles was echoing Mike, um, talking about looking internally, and and I think um, I would like to talk about about Africa. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the countries I've have been uh, interacting with. A few years ago, I was editing a website called African Colors. Um, dot African Colors, it was africancolors.org, uh, as an ads editor. So um, my daily routine involved sending emails, answering emails from writers from West Africa, North Africa, Eastern Africa, and Southern Africa. And so for me, that, that, that um, dialogue within that space, w that, that was it in, 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 in action. Um, at the time also, I was in, I was in Nairobi. And so I was working with my, my colleague Billy there on, on quite a number of projects to do uh, short stories. And then uh, just shortly before I came back, we were discussing a manuscript uh, project which uh, eventually reached fruition. So there is um, a very, uh, um, an example of how this kind of dialogue is happening. However, um, I think that I would like to address this question to the experience that I had. And it's not just enough for the dialogue to, to take place. Um, it is not just enough. I mean, Charles talked about looking eternally, but I also want to th want to say, in regard to the qu to the point I'm making, that I would see I would like to see an extension of some of the uh, of the themes that we have we have here. We're talking about um, sustainable development, and even before I go very far to creative imagination. 
to say there's already a big problem with, with the term development mm -hmm. itself. If we're speaking, uh, um, for instance, uh, through the perspective of the arts, what does development mean? There's an entirely different you know, um, twist to it. And then sustainable, you know, what does it mean? Um, th there is a, um, a new word which somebody coined, this is sustainism. Uh, which oh no <laughs> sustainism uh, i think i think he w he was looking for um, a way to um, go beyond liberalism or marxism all the isms and, and come up with this and w w one of the definitions that struck me was that what is sustainability in terms of human relationships mm -hmm. is it a kind of relationship in which one's participation takes off more from the other than than it gives Okay, now, in, in an even more direct uh, reference here, one of the biggest problems I think I had when we were discussing this with Billy for a very, very long time was what I'm going to call the cost of participation. And, and this is um, such, such a big issue for us because despite having a lot of um, conversation with, with writers and artists from all over the continent, still, the questions about where their careers are going to go next after they've seen the, the they've received the initial um, let's say even the workshop training for, uh, for 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 the various fields of the arts and so it became impossible for me for instance scouring the entire african continent to find somebody I could work with to edit art articles about art Similarly, when, when we were talking about editing uh, books or short stories, it became very, very difficult for us to find the kind of um, qualified personnel to, uh, to help us you know, set the material for, for, for printing. And so you see, um, it happens in these very little places that when you have grounded yourself in the arts for a very long time, you begin to realize that beyond the headline ex um, exclamations, about sustainable development, this and that. When you're, when you're in the arts, the problems of infrastructure, development, and not just infrastructure of a material kind, but having, let's say, somebody who is qualified to look at somebody's work in a technical way. So when I talk about the cost of participation, therefore, it's, um, it's most often if you are in, uh, particularly in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa here, it is somebody in the, one of the North Atlantic countries who then you, 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 you want to keep talking to. But you see, before then you've gotten that other big work of yours done, two years have passed, 10 years have passed. And, 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 and therefore, uh, the sense that, the, the sense becomes created over time that these places cannot produce, produce the arts, but it is there. It's just that what the arts have become for us in Africa involves many more processes that perhaps our economies are yet to wait, uh, are yet to come to a point where they can deliver them. But an, uh, but an individual artist's lifespan doesn't wait that long. Thank Billy, you. I have a question for you, though, before you sit down, because I think you're raising a really important point here that's one of resources. So perhaps it's all very well saying that we should do it ourselves and talk amongst ourselves. But what about the resources? And, and I wonder if you have a solution to that, that uh, you know, the, you're talking about the cost of participation. Is there a solution to the problem that you're setting out? Or if there's a solution you'd like to imagine into being, what would it be? Well, well I think it's, um, before one gets to, to talk about resources, I think um, realizing what the problem is mm. immediately points uh, you know, where the solution might lie. I, I started, um, right in, in entering the arts as a, a writer about the arts back in the mid 90s 90s and over time for instance there's Goretti here i can see Anne there working with all these people for it's nearly 20 years since we made this contact and one of the hopeful things that has struck me is in a way i'm not very surprised about some of things happening like for instance what is happening in uganda today you know, in the last two, three, four, five years, the traffic of international arts connections that had been making its way here, here in Uganda that used to be known for other things, the traffic has gone up. So, and, and I think this is a, a point that I would like to take very seriously, that there is a time and commitment and a lot of passion 
in, in seeing the arts going forward. So I think other than looking for additional resources from somewhere else, is about making our numbers count. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Really, really good points there. Um, yes. Hello. <laughs> Definitely uh, can I just... Yes, I'd, I'd like to... Well, would you like to respond? And then I'd like to ask Shahidul to come in as well. But Karen. Sure. Just, um, you know, it's, it's not only a question of resources. Let's take the area of literature that David and, and Billy are now in, engaged in. And we were having these discussions um, earlier as well. In Kenya, um, a bestseller would be 1,000 books in a population of 37 million people. In South Africa, 54 million people. A bestseller is what, Mark? 5 million? Uh, for 5,000 books? 10,000 books is a bestseller. I mean, you know, no writer is going to live on 10,000 books being sold. It's, and, and so it's not as if there isn't necessarily the market for it in a particular country in terms of quantity of people. It's about whether there's sufficient interest in those particular things. But then also, you know, it's about what I was saying earlier, that developing a market is not only about disposable income, it's also about literacy. If people can't read, if there's not a tradition of kind of growing up with, you know, buying books and having books in the house, yeah. then that's part of what society kind of needs to, mm -hmm. needs to inculcate. Thank you. Um, I want to, I'd like to go back to the point that um, I think both Mike, Billy and, and not Billy, David, <laughs> I know that. David and, and Charles had made about the South to South dialogue. And I, I want to talk about sort of the expanding the possibilities. Um, Shadul, I know that you pioneered the use of email and internet access in Bangladesh. And I just wondered if that the use of digital technologies had actually fed into this dialogue, this talking to each other, not only within your region, but um, beyond it, and if you thought it had a role to play. Well, in fact, the network that we set up was designed to build what you call a South South dialogue. So essentially, we used this was before internet. We set up offline FIDONET links so we could communicate with countries in Africa and Latin America, uh, Asia, relatively cheaply. And it made a huge difference. But there was also a very interesting thing that happened along that time. We, we set up what are called bulletin boards, electronic bulletin boards, on all sorts of issues. Uh, this is early 90s, way before Windows and all, all those sort of things. So everything was written in Roman characters. And there were discussions, important discussions in health and child labor and all sorts of things. At one stage, I started using Bangla in Roman characters. And suddenly, you realized the conversation dramatically shifted. And you realized there was a whole group of people on the periphery who were threatened by this language, who wanted to participate, had important things to say, but couldn't engage because it was not a language they were comfortable with. So I think those are also things uh, to, to bring in. But I, I think we also underestimate what we're capable of. Uh, and, you know, that never helps. I think we need to take it from a position of strength. Uh, in, 19, uh, in 2010, we put together an exhibition called Crossfire, which is a euphemism, euphemism our, our government uses for extrajudicial killings. Um, so we, we set up this show predictably. Uh, the police came, riot police came, surrounded our gallery and everything else. Uh, we, we continued, uh, I mean, of course, we couldn't get through the police, but we used online technologies to actually show the work while the police was surrounding it. We actually had gallery walks inside and things like that. But what it led to was massive street protests. Um, it was headlines on all the major newspapers, televisions. We took the government to court. And the court was sufficiently empowered. And while there is separation from judiciary and uh, executive, in practice, our judiciary generally doesn't question the government. But in this particular case, there was so much public support that the government, uh, that the judiciary felt empowered to rule against the government. And we later got a request from the Supreme Court to show the work in the Supreme Court because they said, we want to learn how when the highest judiciary body in a country is ineffective against the government, a photographic exhibition can bring the government to its knees. Mm. Uh, we need to take that on board, and we have that ability. We don't exercise it enough. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very aware that um, I've been hogging all the questioning time. I'd like to open it out to the audience now, and I'd like to invite um, Ayata Wangusa to start off. Ayata, wave at me. I can't see you. 
Yes, yes there you are. <laughs> I'd like you to invite to start it off and, and then to open out to the wider audience. Thank you. Um, you'd like me to ask a question now? <laughs> to make a statement, to start the conversation. Okay, uh, maybe I'll pick on from what Mike was saying about South Without uh, Networking. And mine is about, um, uh, in East Africa, there's a new model that is taking shape. I don't know if any of you have heard about Power 254 or the NEST. And the idea is seeing how these uh, uh, creative spaces can be linked by technology. So I wanted to know if you, know, you think that's a good idea and maybe something that we can learn across maybe South Africa and East Africa. Thank you. It's, it's very much follows on nicely from what Shahadul was saying about that power of creating that community. And I was particularly interested in what you said about the um, increase in participation when you introduce Bangla onto the, onto the platform. Um, just sort of speaking to what I just said, Francis, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the Pacific region and, and that idea of, of sharing information and the, the use of the internet before we go on to the next audience question. Um, this idea of new media is certainly something that we've played with for a very long time. Um, but we are very, very small island developing states floating in a very vast uh, ocean. And internet accessibility is something that we struggle with. Um, so we do have a number of, of online um, networks that work really, really well. But then we come back to this concept of the artist as the elite. Mm -hmm and then who's marginalized and who's part of that conversation and who's being empowered. Generally, it's already those who have, and you're not really providing any opportunity for those who don't have. So what we're finding is we're going back, we're, we're going back to very old school methods of you know just the daily print media, radio, word of mouth, and just reactivating and mobilizing this idea of, of the collective as a physical gathering space, because the, the internet it works. When, when it works, it's wonderful, but it, it just, it's just so much more exclusive than it is inclusive. I, I love that idea of the collective and, and all of the, the islands joined together. Any other questions from the audience? Um, if you wave at me, we'll send a microphone your way. I could happily talk on that, but I'd much rather hear from you. Um, um, is that a question, Charles? Yes, okay. <coughs> I, I, or oh, let me ask the question. Have you given back to your community? Is this a general question? It's a question for you. Who, who would like to answer that? Who'd like to answer that first? It's a very direct question. Um, the question from Charles is, have you given back to your community? Yes, thank you. I don't see myself as being outside the community. <laughs> uh, uh, so, but it's, it's a very, very valid point. Um, the reason I'm into arts, the reason I do what I do, is because uh, the community matters and I see myself as being part of it. The problem is elsewhere. It is um, where you recognize, as was pointed out, that resources exist elsewhere and you need to maneuver those spaces and continue to be effective, continue to be viable. And one of the things we did, uh, and I, I think it is worth considering, when we started, and this year we'll be 25 years old, from day one we decided we were not going to be a funded organization. We were not going to be an NGO. We would start small but self-sufficient. And in the process, I think we've been able to build an organization that, A, has a different work ethics to what, what might otherwise have developed, and B, have a resilience and a spunk that very few other organizations have. We are far more able to be critical of our government because we do not take a penny from them. We are far more critical of development organizations because we do not depend upon them for our salaries. And I think we need to create those spaces in order to be able to give back, as you say. Yes, um, towards the back. I just wanted to say about um, the new media and how, okay, I don't know about the 100 and, and stuff like, so I'm not uh, a big social media fan, but I'm thinking it's not a bad avenue to express yourself because you, you have to look as the new media as a channel 
to express your views. It's not a bad thing. It's probably the way you express it. And there's also this thing called blogging, which I know a lot of writers do around here, which is causing a lot of um, waves. Uh, um, among a lot of writers, not only just in Uganda, but I mean globally and all. And I'm not saying that you should shy, out. it's not that we are shying away from the public. Okay, yeah, you can look at the statistics, let's say 34 million Ugandans over, I mean, out of the 100,000 who might be on, t on Twitter, but the 100,000 are actually the people who will speak about it outside of the social media. So let's say one of the 100,000 goes and speaks to about 20 other people. That multiplies and it counts to something. It's not nothing. And I don't think we should consider it as nothing. It is something. Thank you. Another question. Um, ah, yeah, okay, let's do the lady in green. And then there's a gentleman in front of her. And then Mr. Kaiser over here. If we do it in that order. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Harriet Anena. Um, I'm a poet and a journalist. I, I'd like to pick up from where Charles, the question Charles asked, that have, have, you, have you given back to the community? Um, you know, there's often an assumption that we write for the community or we write for an audience. But when, when our work fails to connect with the people, then it means we are either assuming or we are writing things for ourselves. That's why the conversation we should be having is what kind of discussion are we having and uh, what is it directed at or who is the discussion directed to so that we can then um, pick up from there. Because uh, if we assume that we are part of the community without uh, without ascertaining whether there's a connection between us, between our work and the community, then we might be living uh, in the skies. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much. And if you give the microphone to the gentleman in front of you, thank you for that comment. Thank you. I'm Comfort Wery Senyange. I'm an intern pharmacist with Mulago Hospital. Uh, my question is basically, how does science come in? Because we've been talking about the arts. And personally, I remember when I was uh, doing my high school, I wanted to offer physics, chemistry, biology, and literature. But my school refused, said you can't do that. You have to stroke it with math or something else, but not literature. So how can we bring science into this? Cause there are very many scientists out there, and they, they may not qualify to be called artists, but they would love to come in, write, do the poetry, and we would love to be part of it. Thank you. Wow, I wasn't expecting that question. Thank you. So I, I would really like to see if there's anyone in the audience or on the panel who will answer Comfort's question about what about science and this whole conversation. Um, yes. Are you answering Comfort's question? Yes, brilliant. The lady at the back. I think it's all about a passion. And even if you're a scientist, it will always come out if it's there. Because personally, I'm a mathematician, but I'm a poet as well and a writer in the media. So my colleagues always ask me, but what are you doing here? Get out. <laughs> <laughs> so just. You know, writing, it's, in with, it's within you and it will come out. It will find a way out. So don't let it die in there. Just get it out. Even if you're a doctor, an engineer, or what. Thank you very much. And some more questions. Let's go to the side of the room. Um, yes, please. Okay. Um, if I could just respond to comfort, I think it was. Um, I go back to this concept of, of art aesthetics and, and art as, as part of a living culture. Um, if I draw from Pacific Island cultures, science and everything else cannot be demarcated. And so when we talk about sustainable development and the great global north thinkers tell us you need to think about the economy as a pillar and then environment and then society and then culture as a cross-cutting. As a Pacific Islander, I can't wrap my head around it because there is no such thing as one without the other. They are all at once 
interacting. And so from that Pacific Island lens, and I assume that it would be very similar in other indigenous cultures, that when you think about science, there is beauty in it. Mm. The navigator is a scientist, understanding the weather, understanding the, the heritage arts and creative expression, that everything really is one and in balance. And I think that when we learn, not only as, as art activists or as development thinkers, to see that there is so much more synergy than there is demarcations between, that that is when development will begin to serve people. But when we continue to draw the barriers between, we will constantly find ourselves in the conflict that we are in now. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, David Kaiser, and the young lady with the maroon scarf. Uh, thank you very much um, for giving me this other opportunity. I think I would rather I would like to bell the cat so since I brought up the. the um, I started talking about um, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, over the last few years, because I've been working so closely with so many people in the arts from so many different sectors, from film, music, visual arts, um, I think one of the earliest assumptions that one that I had when I was getting into this uh, very, very close and intense working with the arts was that there is so many, so much more avenues for putting out your thing. There is YouTube, um, you can desktop publish and do all of that. But one of the most important lessons I've learned is that um, the point of, of exhibition, of, of, of publishing your work as it were, is um, and also the environment in which you work, i.e. is it quiet, is there a church ne next to you, you can't think uh, that <laughs> when you're trying to write. This I've also found it is also very difficult, different from what I was calling the human infrastructure, i.e. that um, there's, a, there's a group that producing music and film and they, they've been putting their stuff on YouTube. But when I entered conversation with them again, the, the old question comes, human intervention. Where is that person who knows how to make or destroy the film in the studio before it is put on YouTube? And similarly with a book, um, where is that human intervention in terms of somebody reading your work and telling you, you have used this, fr this phrase wrongly, or this subject matter, you need to do a bit more research into that. You know, to, so, so that um, the kind of um, common complaint we hear that whenever books from some of these uh, struggling places and collectives in Africa uh, coming up for international awards and competition. The story is nice, but the book isn't, you know, holding somewhere there. So that's what I was referring to as human infrastructure, something which technology will never take away and cannot invent for us. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Asumta Nantume, and it wasn't a question. I was responding to what Comfort was saying. Hi, Comfort. Um, I'm a pharmacist too, and I work with Mulago too. And um, I started writing when I was seven, I think. And um, my first like um, opportunity to be published came when I was 16. I was asked to write for a science journal. But um, I guess because I was a scientist and I had some um, talent at writing, he thought I would do well at helping, my editor thought I would do well at promoting this science journal. And I did write, but my topics were very, they were too much about science. He'd give me topics and that I'd have to develop those ideas, but they weren't from me. They weren't my ideas. They, weren't, they didn't come from my heart. But I still loved that I was writing. So this journal I was writing for, the science journal, it didn't make it very long. We were in for about a year, and we collapsed after that. But through that, um, I was discovered by another editor for the New Vision, who invited me to write there. And he gave me a, a white card. I could write anything I wanted to. And then I realized that even as a scientist, because I also did physics, chemistry, biology, math, it took nothing away from my ability to have these social observations that artists have. So even though through my education, I identify as a scientist, I don't identify 
in isolation as a scientist. Thank so you, you can much. be a scientist, you can be an artist, and you can write about science, but it doesn't have to be about science. I tend to find science quite boring, even though <laughs> I love um, the Thank you very much for that. That's great. Um, we, we do have a reception afterwards, and I'm going to limit this to one more question, but then, uh, yes, but then invite you to continue the conversation yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. So, yes, yes, I know. So, um, Lucy, had you had... Indicated. Yes. I'm so sorry, I'm ignoring and you're waving. So the gentleman at the back will be our, our last questioner before we, we move on to the reception area. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Tura Kira Regan. I am a software developer, which makes me a scientist, and I am a writer. My question is uh, about something uh, the gentleman shared, uh, the one who spoke with a lot of passion, and I loved it. Uh, you said, and I agree with you, that now the arts seem to be a vehicle for the other society changers. Uh, if you look at uh, culture, politics, and the military religion, they seem to just come to us when they need us. My question is, how then do we get back to the driver's seat, or how then do we get our own vehicle so that we can also drive the agenda as opposed to being used to drive the agenda of other people? Really great question. Um, I wonder which panelists would like to answer that before we close. Shall I do my turn? Yes. Um, <laughs> a big question, starting yeah. off with a big <laughs> one and ending. Um, you know, for me, I think if I had to have a closing comment, it would be this. When we speak about sustainable development and so on, we often speak about it in relation to natural resources that you know we must only use that which we need for this current generation without compromising the ability of future generations to kind of take care of their own needs. Um, but for me, even if one undertook development, sustainable development on those terms, um, unless within societies there was there was social justice, that sustainable development is unsustainable because for as long as there's inequity, major inequities, development is unsustainable. You know, there'll always be tensions within society. So I think for me, how we get to reassert ourselves on some kind of agenda, as it were, is to be part of struggles for social change, struggles for justice, struggles for equity. And unless we locate ourselves there, you know, we don't, in my view, have a right to really be um, asking people to take us seriously because it means that we are not taking issues that are serious for a whole bunch of people in our societies. We are not taking those issues seriously. Thank you very much, Mike. Francis, I'd like to ask you to sort of respond but also to make a closing comment in response to that. Here we go. Thank you. Um, ooh, sustainable development. I'd like to ask a couple of questions and I, I know we, we, we've kind of, we haven't really come back to the, the cultural or creative organizations and uh, groups and what responsibilities we have mm. and how we can be drivers or agents uh, for sustainable development. And I, I guess I'd like to challenge each one of us here to question our own roles. And I love the question that was asked, what have you done? Um, and I can proudly say, I've done. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's why, I, I mean, that's, that's why I do what I do because Basically, the people we would like to thrive, not to survive, but to thrive, are marginalized peoples without voice. They are artists and practitioners who are disempowered because the drivers of development are driving it for their own agendas, whether it's individuals, whether it's organizations. Unfortunately, our cultural policies can only go so far, funding and resources can only go so far, but it's the leadership and it's the, the creating that empowerment and the agency to bring about the change. So for me, the question or the challenges I'd like to leave with you is, what are we developing? <laughs> who are we developing? For what purpose are we developing? And who is going to benefit from all of this development? And is development ever really sustainable? And again, you can ask the same questions in terms of sustainability and sustainable development, coining two very loaded concepts. And so I, w I would much rather, as an education for sustainable educator, um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> ironically, I am an educator who focuses on education for sustainable development. Increasingly, I find myself thinking about sustainability and about people and communities thriving. 
not just surviving, not just learning to play a game by someone else's rules, but becoming empowered to the point that they recognize that even without funding, we can agitate, we can resist, we can bring about change. And the change will be slow, but it will be sure. And isn't that what sustainability means? Because when we continue to look at, at external funding and resources, the moment the funding stops, so does the project. And so I think, for me, the message would be, yes, I, I love the idea of, of, of the South, South conversation, but I've been part of this dialogue for almost 20 years now, and every time I sit at one of these events, particularly at the ACP level, the P really is the appendix. I'm really in a room with 50 Africans, and each of them proud and loud, and I'm the one Pacific Islander in the corner, that nobody really cares about because we're just little islands floating in this vast ocean. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Well, it is a really bad thing. It's great to be at the table, but, you know, I mean, it would be nice if there were some crumbs. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think what I'm saying is the South-South conversation needs to happen within as well. And so we need to begin talking to ourselves that we need to be introspective before we can begin a conversation in the wider region. Um, and I love this opportunity, and I love that there's so much synergy in the conversation. Um, but at the same time, when the conversation is over, will we remain as, as impassioned as we are now? And will we act? And when someone else stands and says, so have you given back? Can we then proudly say, you know, yes, I have. And I think that's what we need in our communities. That's what we need in terms of sustainability and sustainable development. We need. First, sustainable leadership and good governance. And good governance not necessarily in the global north definitions of good governance, but understanding what good governance means in our context and how the arts can thrive. And if we are developing the arts, then it comes back to my original question. Who are we developing it for and for what purpose? So I think those are just a few of, of the messages I'd love to leave you with. Thank you very much.